distinguished guests, distinguished guests, honorable speakers, members of Cameroonian Nurses Association, our patrons, and our moderators. You are all welcome to this very first Cameroonian Nurses webinar. It gives me great pleasure and great joy to welcome all of you to this very significant event in the history of Cameroonian Nurses Association. Being a Saturday, a very cool, wet Saturday afternoon in London, I cannot thank you all enough for giving your time and taking your time to join us. So you're all welcome. We've got two wonderful, fantastic moderators who are going to moderate this event to the end. So my job as the president of Cameroonian Nurses Association for this occasion is to welcome both of them and to introduce them. So they've got the biggest job to do. So our moderators for the event is in the person of Barista Kafu. Barista, you're welcome. Thank so you so Julius, much, Mr. President. Julius is an expert in international arbitration, a fellow chartered member of arbitration and member of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration. He is a fantastic mediator and a barrister who has been called to bar to both England and Wales and Cameroon. Julius also lectures in international arbitration at the Chartered Institute of Arbitration. He's got 22 years plus of legal experience internationally in Cameroon and in the UK. Barrister, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Madam President. Our second moderator is in the person of Dr. Rosemary Bonley. Dr. Bonley is our own very academic within this miss. She has, she's a senior lecturer. She's lectured in universities in the UK and abroad. She's had 26 years of lecturing. She's lectured in University of Southbank, Bedfordshire, and Coventry universities. She is, she's got great experience in strategic marketing, public relations, strategic management, and international business. She is, she's got experience in consultancy, cost management, and development. 
She's worked in Cameroon, Singapore, Middle East, and some of the African countries. She is also the chairperson of the Millennium Group in abbreviation, which is a charitable group, Cameroonian group called TMG. She's also a school governor and one of her patrons, just like Barrister Kafu. So you're both welcome. And the floor is open to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes clearly. Good, good, good. So thank you, Madam President. So Madam President of the Cameroon Nurses Association, fellow nurses of the Cameroon Association, distinguished speakers, my co-moderator, Bariston Kafu, and all our invited guests. Good afternoon and welcome to the very first webinar organized by the Cameroon Nurses Association. The topic for this webinar is, and I'm quoting it, our experiences working in the NHS as black and ethnic minority nurses and midwives, looking at three generations. So note that these experiences would span over three generations. So this will be an opportunity to provide us, or I'm hoping, and I'm quite sure the audience will equally be looking forward to that, to getting the different perspectives you know, on um, the experiences. This topic is especially relevant because it comes at a time when nurses, especially in the UK, have been catapulted to the forefront and are accoladed as our true heroes. However, nurses, especially the black and ethnic minority nurses, have not easily attained this status. Being a black and ethnic minority professional myself, I am pretty sure that their journey or the journey that they're going to recount today has been fraught with highs and lows. It is therefore my pleasure to invite my core moderator, Bariston Kafu, to introduce our, our first speaker who will share her experiences. So over to you, Bariston Kafu. Thank you very much, Dr. Bunley, for the very uh, uh, informative opening and, and, and for the very clear and, and, and precise um, route that we are going to be going down this um, afternoon. We are blessed uh, with the presence of three distinguished speakers who, as you rightly say, will be telling us um, uh, about their journey uh, in the nursing world. And, and, and the speakers we've got have got a very big, uh, they, they've all got very big bags of experience that it will not be just and, and right to introduce them in minutes. In fact, uh, in fact we could write books about the, uh, the experiences they come up with. Uh, in the circumstance, I'm just going to uh, I'll give them the liberty, they have the liberty to say more about themselves as they go um, along. Uh, but I'm going to invite the first speaker uh, in the person of uh, Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Tamufo, who is a clinical uh, nurse specialist uh, and uh, she specializes in women's health and has been doing so with the NHS for the past uh, 20 years. She works with uh, consultants um, uh, to diagnose um, uh, 
in the diagnosis of cancer and provide support with not only the, 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 the consultants, doctors, and family members within the community. Without further ado, we invite uh, Mrs. Tamufo to present her paper. In this. Mrs. Tamufo, the floor is yours. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, members of the CNA. <clears throat> 20 years experience in the NHS. My first nursing experience uh, position in the NHS was on a very busy surgical ward as a D-grade staff nurse in a, in a London hospital. It was a 38 bed mixed ward with male and female separate bay and three side rooms. <clears throat> My experience was full of excitement and apprehension starting my first course and then um but there was also lots of highs and lows uh, attributed to the position as a qualified nurse now fully responsible and accountable for my patient allocated to, to provide full care holistically to ensure the, the, the admission, delivery of care and safe discharge to the community. Um, <clears throat> My, my experience on the ward as a newly qualified nurse was fraught with um, a lot of anxiety because there were no preceptorship to, to help me to transition to a more effective and skilled full um, a nurse. So um, the setup she wasn't available due to the lack of uh, staff nurses, shortages and sicknesses, and fast turnover of manager changing position in the world from lasting for three to six months in the post. However, <clears throat> my experience in acute ward setting were quite pleasant at times and unpleasant at certain times. Um, I enjoy working with a team of nurses and ensuring that good communication was maintained with patient confidentiality, privacy, dignity, and respect was given to patients who were under my care on the ward. I was glad to have achieved my qualification as a trained nurse after three years of training and being part of the member of the NMC qualified professional to provide 
safe, effective care to patients and the public without undue harm. Um, Working in an acute ward setting was very challenging. Having to work as on a 24-hour basis on 12-hour shift, day or night, were quite challenging at times. Um, the shift pattern were mixed shift of two to three days or two days, three nights or five nights and mixture of days. I felt gratified that I was able to provide safe care to all my patients, seeing them through admission until safe discharge back to the community with full package of continuity of care to ensure they remain independent in the society and participate in the normal activity. I felt Gratify that I was making a difference in the life of people I was caring for, in providing them seamless care with the highest standards of skills and knowledge acquired throughout my, my training. However, there were lots of highs and lows moment in my working career. Being in an acute setting on the ward and clin or clinical setting in our patient, there, there are a few I would, would be mentioned here in, the, in, the, in terms of highs and lows. I will list the few of a high moment and low moment in my career spanning from 20, 2001 till today. I will list the, 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 the low moment first and expand on a few of them. Then list the high moment and expand on a few of them. Sorry, uh, sorry, Mrs. Tumfos, I really don't want to interrupt your flow. Just to say that each presenter has 10 minutes. Uh, and so you may want to just choose the key ones you want to uh, list and expand on so that you how don't get caught out of I, time. How many more minutes have I got? Well, you've got about four minutes. Okay, right. The low moment were, were, were mostly discrimination, lack of uh, promotion prospect, and uh, discouragement in um, you know postgraduate uh, uh, study because of a shortage of staff and sicknesses. The high moments were. My joy of being able to be providing, making a difference in the life of sick people, supporting and guiding those are, are under my care, ensuring they receive the best standard of care provided by the NHS, and um, feeling satisfied that I'm able to be independently financed be, be financially independent in earning my own income to provide a better well-being for myself and my family. And it, it's been a joy 
working in the NHS till date, despite the, the disadvantages that uh, I, I go through or that I have gained a lot of knowledge and skills in supporting, providing care, and looking after myself in a better way through the, the knowledge and the skill I've acquired throughout my training. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it any more than what I have gained or what I've been through. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Tamufo. That was really very enriching. Um, um, it just really strikes the chord that you're up there to uphold the dignity, the pride, the independence of suffering people. It can't get better than that. Thank you so much. Like uh, Dr. Burnley said, uh, she talked about the spread. So the spread of experiences, meaning that uh, we're going to generations um, and generations from the, from the young to the not so young. Uh, and our next speaker is um, uh, a young person in a younger generation. And uh, this is in the person of um, Isabel Akinola. Uh, Isabel uh, is a children's nurse with seven years experience in children's services. Uh, her current role is pediatric A and E sister in one of the North London uh, Trusts. She's also an ACP trainee. Um, uh, ACP means Advanced Clinical Practitioner. Uh, Mr. Kinso Akinola, you have the floor, uh, 10 minutes. Your time starts now. You, I think you're on mute, we can't hear you. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Hi. So yeah, so my name is Isabel. Um, like you said, I'm a pediatric sister. I work in Amy. Um, I basically started nursing when I was um, 19 years old. Um, I actually studied in Wolverhampton. Um, and in Wolverhampton, there's hardly any like black people there. So, but luckily there was people um, from London who actually traveled there in terms of to do university. So it was fine. But on my actual course, there was hardly any black people on it um, because we used to have lectures. And to be fair, there wasn't a lot of young black um, people on my course. There was a lot of older women who had kids and stuff. And I even remember even like um, coming to view the, the university, they spoke to my mum and they said to my mum, are you joining? And then she said, no, it's my daughter. And they said, how old is your daughter? And they, she said, she's 18. And they were like, oh, well, she's a bit young to be a nurse. I don't think she'll cope with it. Um, but anyways, I've done it um, moving forward. And then I came back to London um, and I did my first post um, in a North London hospital. Um, it was a rotational post. So um, I basically started off on the paediatric general ward, then I moved on to the neonatal unit, and then I moved on to a &E. And initially I wanted to start off in a &E, finishing a &E, but I really, I thought, um, not a &E, neonates, but then I ended up really liking um, a &E, so I stayed there. Um, again, it was really nice, I enjoyed it, but I just wanted something different. So I ended up going to the community and I was basically an immunization nurse. Um, didn't really like it because it was very slow paced for me and um, it wasn't that challenging. So I decided to move back um, into the a &E setting and basically I've just been doing that for a while now. Um, and then through that, I've basically just done emergency courses um, and just basically gained experience on how to basically assess an unwell child, um, which actually has been beneficial because I have a nephew. So it's nice giving my sister advice and stuff like that about, you know, you know, what to do. And like, it's probably this, it's probably that. So um, it's yeah. And I guess it will help me in the long run when I start having my own. Um, so yeah so that's basically it um and then now I'm training to be an advanced clinical practitioner which basically means you kind of work like a mini doctor where you um 
assess children you you know you assess them you treat them and you discharge them home and if you need any advice you obviously speak to a pediatric consultant or um you discuss it with um, another speciality really um but in terms of my experience um to be honest being quite young I probably didn't notice a lot of things in terms of um um being um an ethnic minority it's only now that I'm a lot older and I I see I can see the new um nurses that are qualified who are only 20 or 21 sorry or 22 and I see the way they treat them sometimes and depending on you know and I don't know sometimes if it's because of their lack of knowledge or because because they're actually black um but sometimes I do think it's because they're black because sometimes they don't really know how to be professional um in terms of speaking still um or what not to say or how to say appropriately um so yeah that's pretty much it in terms of my experience um I I haven't really um experienced anything where it's affected me in terms of work but I have had some um challenging moments um but I have been supported appropriately by um to be fair a lot of senior um nurses um who are also black so they know exactly so I've never felt basically discouraged I've just basically they've always told me just you need to fight basically you need to stand up for yourself because the one thing they will do is they'll because they'll look at your age and a lot of people think I'm younger than I actually am so they will try and challenge you in that behavior so I feel like sometimes even when I am also at work I have to actually say hi my name is Isabel I am one of the senior sisters I am one of the I'm the nurse in charge because I feel like sometimes when they look around they're looking around for the white nurse uh, and someone probably a lot older um so there's always that aspect of it but um but, but yeah that's that's pretty much it really <laughs> yeah okay all right thank you so much isabel i think you know that yeah, your experience is quite um, enriching um uh, and, and even though you say that um you know you you uh you get mixed up sometimes in a way that they come in the ward and they see you uh, and they're looking for, around for a whiteness, meaning that they don't believe that you can be the person in charge, but you know, you are the person in charge and well done for, for, for that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you'll have quite um, some um, opportunity to come back when there'll be questions, because I think uh, I will certainly have a question for you. Not okay. a hard question, by the way. And okay. Ms. Uh, Tamfo, I hope you're not, you're, you're, you're there because there'll be question and answer sessions for, and for all the speakers, an opportunity again, for you to come back and um, say more about your experiences. Now, we're doing fine for time because uh, Isabel didn't use um, uh, most of our, uh, we used all of our time. And, and so we've got a, a spare time in that um, regard. I'm going to now introduce the last but not least speaker uh, as I said, they all have got great credentials, plenty of experience, and um, uh, they, they will say more about themselves or the, as we carry on in the evening. The next speaker is uh, Dr. John Myers, OBE, uh, QN. John has over 35 years experience as a strategic nurse leader consultant and educator in community children's nursing services across London. She has worked as an advisor to the chief nursing officer for England in the NHS for 10 years, including being the chair of the CNO BME strategic advisory group for five years up to 2017. Uh, John, in 2018, received the Florence Nightingale uh, Foundation Leadership Scholarship and traveled to the Netherlands to learn more about the Bootstrap model. In 2019, she became a trustee and director with the Florence Nightingale Foundation. She is um, a multi award winning nurse and has received an OBE for services to children and nurses uh, and was on the Queen's um, uh, birthday honours list in 2013. She owns and runs a charity 
providing education and support for over 25 vulnerable children and their family in Nakuru in Kenya. Uh, Dr. Myers, your time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I feel honored to be at your very first um, um, conference or meeting for the Cameroon nurses. Privileged to be here. And it was wonderful to hear Elizabeth's um, storyline and Isabella as well. Really great. And to know that, um, is it Elizabeth, is it, or both of you, are pediatric nurses as well? I think they're both, or, um, Isabella is a pediatric nurse and I, when I did my paediatric training, I wanted to work in A&E and I worked in A&E for a year, then did cardiothoracics and then came out into the community. So children is my heart. So it's good to hear your stories as well. I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. So um, let's see if I could screen share. Let's see if we can see that. Can you, can you see the slides? Yes, okay. yes, good, we can see it. Fantastic. I'm going to be talking about my legacy in nursing. I know I look very young, like Isabella Black, don't crack. So um, that's one of the, I think one of the perks of being black. You know, people always look at it in a negative kind of way, but it's positive. Okay, my legacy in, oops, my leg legacy in nursing. Um, I, I, this first slide, I've got this first slide here because when I was at school, I was told I was below O-level standard and incapable of writing an essay and they advised my mother to let me leave school because I was wasting her time, my time and their time and I just want you to see all those letters I got after my name there. My mum asked me how many more letters do I need and I said well there's 26 in the alphabet but I think I've got there already now but just to show just because people say you can't do it doesn't mean you can't you can't do it. You, it's up to you. You can make up your mind. I was born in this country. My parents come from Jamaica and um, when I went to school, the teachers were very racist and really bad. But um, I always wanted to be a nurse. I'm just showing you my qualifications there. Always wanted to be a nurse from the age of three. My mother gave me a nurse's uniform. And from that day, I wanted to be a nurse. And when I was 11 years old, my mum did her nurse training. And she advised me not to do nursing because she said, you won't like it. They will treat you really bad. They're all racist. And I said, no, no, I don't want to be anything else but a nurse. And she made me promise not to do Enrolled nursing, there was two levels of nursing like there is now. They had um, the second, that enrolled nurses, there were the practical hands-on nurses that did the real, real nursing jobs, where like um, nursing associates in that is now. And then there was the registered nursing, which was the, the three-year course that allowed you to go up into management. So most of the black nurses were advised to do the two-year practical one. And my mother told me not to do it. She was an enrolled nurse. It was a brilliant um, role to be but she said if you want to go up the ladder you have to do the registered nursing I needed five O levels to do it I proved them all wrong at school they told me I couldn't do it so I showed them I could I failed my O levels or GCSEs first time and second time third time I sort of woke up and realized it's up to me not them and did eight O levels and went on to do my A levels and everything and then I got into my nursing went for my interview they told me um why don't you do the two-year course why do three years when you could do two years and because my mother told me what the difference was, I was able to say, no, I'm doing a three year one. So I was one of the very few black nurses at that time that was able to go into up in management and do other things. Um, so that's me when I qualified as a, pediat a pediatric nurse, I was working at Guy's Hospital. And at Guy's, I did my general at Lewisham Hospital and um, the Guy's nurses said, we at Guy's don't you like Lewisham nurses because they were very yardy dull. Most of them trained at Tommy's and then specialised at Guy's and thought they were better than everybody else. And I, I was one of the very few black people. Like what Isabella said, most of the things that they said and did went over my head. I wasn't really interested. In. <laughs> and then people would say, did you know that's a racist comment or that's derogatory or whatever? And I would say, well, it's their problem, not mine. I'm not bothered. Let them sort themselves out. And it wasn't until when I did my master's and I learned about understanding self and your strengths and weaknesses, that my eyes was open. And then things that people were saying, I think, why did they just say that? What did they mean about that? And then that's when I started getting angry and started standing up for myself. Um, then I, I worked in, so just to go back to this one, I qualified as a registered general nurse, went on straight away, did paediatrics, and then I became a Christian and I wanted to go to church on Sundays. And because 
on the ward at that time, they didn't have flexible working. And um, the, if they didn't like you, they just didn't give you the shifts that you wanted them because I was black. They gave all the black people the bad shifts. So I used to do seven nights in a row, seven 10 hour shifts in a row, seven nights off, early shift, late shift, early shift, late shift, and then back on nights again. And I said to the sister, can I just have a Sunday off leave even once a month to go to church? And she told me, I should have thought about that before I came into nursing and I can't have every weekends off and I cannot work nine to five Monday to Friday as a nurse. And I said, I don't particularly want to, I just want to have Sunday once in a while. And she said, I couldn't. And I, I just thought, usually when they say no, you have to figure out a way of getting to do what you really want to do. And I realized that she didn't like doing the off-duty rotor. So I asked her if I could do the rotor and I did the rotor and I asked everybody. In those days, they used to just give you whatever shifts they wanted. But I went around and I asked everybody on the ward, who wants to work on my Sunday and I will work on your Friday and Saturday. And of course, everybody wants sun, um, everybody wants Friday and Saturday off. So I had six Sundays in a row. It was fantastic. Until the sister on the ward found out and she said, I told you, you cannot work nine to five, Monday to Friday as a nurse and have every weekend off. And I said, I don't particularly want to, but because you said I can't, I'm going to. And at that time, somebody had handed me an unpublished dissertation about working in the community. And at that time, there was only district nursing and health visiting. There wasn't community children's nursing at all. There was only about 28 paediatric home care teams, as they call them, in the whole of the UK. But I read this unpublished dissertation about working in the community, and I decided that I wanted to be a paediatric district nurse, and that's what I was going to do. So I wrote my own job description, and I put 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, every weekend off. I was an F grade nurse. In those days, they had letters rather than numbers. F grade is like a band six or seven. Um, and I put F grade and I wrote down what I wanted to do. And I sent it to all the health authorities in London and nobody wrote back to me. But then my friend was working in Camberwell and she got a new job there. And I thought, I never wrote to them. I'm going to phone them. And I phoned them up and I said, I'd like to be a paediatric home care nurse. Have you got any vacancies? And they said it sounded like something they were advertising, but the closing date was the day before. And I begged them to send me an application form. And I think to get rid of me, they just sent it. They didn't send it for 10 days. And then I phoned them up. I said, I know where you are. I'm coming to get it. And they said, it's OK. And they sent me the form 10 days later. Their job description was the spitting image of my job description. The only difference was it was a G grade, the next level up, £5,000 more. But it was 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, every weekend's off. I went for that interview. As far as I was concerned, the job was mine. When you go for interviews, you don't need to go, you don't have to worry about how many other people are applying for the job. It's your job. If you want it, go and get it. I went to that interview. They asked me all these questions. I answered, they said, what research have you read recently? Keep up to date with research in your specialist area, in your field that you're working in. Keep up to date. What research have you read recently? And I was able to talk about this unpublished dissertation and what, what it was and everything. And I spoke like I knew what I was talking about. And then at the end of the interview, they asked me, have you got any questions? In an interview, when they ask you, have you got any questions, it's your opportunity to interview them to find out whether you want to work with them. But I didn't know that. All I knew is that I wanted the job. So I just said to them, I've got no questions, but I'll take this job. I'm only taking it on conditions that you sponsor me to do my district nursing course. I said, I'll work for you for a year and then you could pay me as an F grade and then you could send me off to do the course. And then when I, after the course, I could come back as a G grade. And they just looked at me and they said, we have many other applicants, we'll let you know. But they phoned me up, offered me the job. And when I went for the job, the first day I started, they said the paediatric home care team starts the day with you, get the paperwork, get the patients and tell everybody about it. And it was only at that point that I realised I didn't have a clue. They paid for me to do my um, district nursing course. The guy that wrote the unpublished paper, I went um, dissertation, I went to see him. He became my mentor and he taught me everything that I needed to know. So I worked in that paediatric home care team in Camberwell for three years. And that's another thing, write articles, write reports go to conferences, talk about what you do, because many of us hide our light under a bushel, nobody knows what we're doing, and then we're wondering why nobody's acknowledging us. And because I wrote a report about the team, because it was a brand new team set up from scratch, I did the sickle cell course, I had a nurse that did asthma, um, oncology, special care baby, and we did burns and wounds, dressings and everything, and HIV and AIDS, because it was around at that time. And we, we were a fantastic, phenomenal team. And at the end of three years, they just basically said, goodbye, you're the weakest link, we don't need you anymore. I said, I ain't going nowhere. You gave me a permanent job. You need to find me a permanent job, equal and equivalent to what I was doing before. I was offered jobs in the hospitals, even direct to post. I refused to go back in the hospital. And a week before the whole team was disbanded, practically all the nurses had gone. It was me and one other nurse left. Um, I got a phone call from Lambeth to said, we heard about what you've done in Camberwell. Could you come to Lambeth? 
And I went to West Lambeth, set up the team there, worked on that team there. Then I went to um, Westminster, to St Mary's Paediatric Home Care Team in Paddington, where that guy had written his unpublished dissertation and was my mentor. And I went and worked on that team as a team coordinator. I moved the team out of the hospital and called, I said, we're not called a paediatric home care team, we're called community children's nurses. So that's what we're going to be. So I called them Westminster Community Children's Nursing. It was very challenging. There, there was a doctor there that hated my guts. She did everything to torment me and everybody thought it was me. And somebody mentioned about managing your emotions. I didn't know because she was just pulled me into my own office and she'd be shouting and ranting at me and telling me what to do. And I'll be going, OK, whatever. I mean, how can you bully me? And then go leave the meeting and we're going to a big meeting and she'll tell everybody that, oh, Joan and I have been discussing blah, blah, blah. And we're going to do this, this and this. And I look at her across the room and I put my hand up. I go, actually, I had time to reflect on that. And I don't think it's a good idea because of this, this and this. And then she'll go, really, she couldn't do anything about it because I was the nurse leader. She wanted to take over my team. And it took two years before my managers realised it was her and not me because she actually basically told them to get rid of me. And they, they said they've got no question about my competency, my ability to do my job or my professionalism. So she has to sort herself out. And that's, and that's when they came to support me, but it was too late by then. And just to let you know, everything that happens to you happens to you for a reason. Those two years was like a masterclass in how to deal with medical doctors and consultants and the whole lot of them. Because when I got my next role, my next role was as a nurse consultant for community children's nursing, the first and only of its kind in the whole of the UK. And it was all that stuff that I learned about that doctor's bad behaviour that helped me to get to the next level. So just, just to show me show you all my roles. So I came out in the community in 1990, paediatric home care team nurse. All those um, roles that's underlined and in bold are all brand new roles that never, ever existed. So that was a brand new role. And then when I became a community children's nurse team leader in 94, that was a brand new role. Nurse consultant for community children's nursing, completely new role. When I was in that role, and um, after about three weeks, I asked my manager, um, what do you want me to do? Nobody's telling me what to do. She goes, no, Joan, you're supposed to tell us what to do. I goes, oh, okay, then we need to do this, this, this. It was just absolutely, that was my best role ever. Then I became a nurse consultant for children and young people in Northeast London. And my last role in healthcare was associate director and chief nurse in Richmond and Kingston. And I never thought I'd become a chief nurse. And that's another thing. When you're going up the ladder, you need people to support you and develop you along the way. And when I became the chief nurse, when you're new in a row, make sure you ask for all the things that you want. I said to the, the chief exec, he was my line manager, I said, I need executive coaching to move from a nurse consultant to a chief nurse is a big, big jump. And he said, of course, we'll pay for you to have a coach. I said, this is a coach that I want. I want Dr. Nesley Watson, Drury, CBE. He goes, oh, but I want her because now I've got her already. I have to find somebody else for you. And she was my coach all the way through until I left. And then my last role, I'm, I'm director and trust at trustee at the Florence Nightingale Foundation and um, last year I set up my own consultancy where I do mentoring and coaching and career profession and support for people for our people that think that they're not good but they're absolutely brilliant so I draw it all out of them let them see how phenomenal they are and practically every lot one of them get their jobs after they've come to me for interview prep and preparation for their new roles. Um, one of my greatest achievements was setting up nurse-led eczema clinic in Islington because, um, as you know, I was on the NICE guidance, uh, no, the NICE guidance, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, guidance for children and young people with eczema under the age of 12. I was the only black person on that panel. And that's why I believe black people, black and brown people, we need to be represented on all panels, boards, committees, trustees, anywhere where there's decision making then we need to be around the table because if we're not around the table, they're not going to talk about us except for to eat us for dinner. So we need to be about to, around the table so we can make decisions about what's important for us. And I was able to say to them at that meeting, did you know that black skin is different to white skin? Because you know, experts to do it to skin, you'd think they would know that. They do know that, but they don't talk about it. And because I said it, and they said, yes, we know. I said, well, um, black skin doesn't like that white watery cream that doesn't sink into their skin and it doesn't feel right when they put it on. They need we're used to oily emollient stuff that goes into the skin and it presents differently. So many times you misdiagnose it because it doesn't start in the creases, it starts on the outside and it gets worse than in the white skin. And so you misdiagnose it and you say it's scabies and you say it's ringworms when it's not. How could a baby have ringworm and scabies? It's brand new and stuff. And so because I said that, they wrote it into the guidance. You can see it today that children from African, Caribbean and Asian community, communities are more likely to present differently to other children and also GPs are all aware that our skin perverts the first oily emollient creams rather than the um, emollients rather than the creamy white stuff 
sort of doesn't that rubs off. Setting up the clinic was a challenge because the doctor didn't want the dermatologist didn't want me to, but you have to always find out a way around. I found a nurse consultant for dermatology that sat in my clinics with me and supported me. I did the nurse prescribing course. I wrote my own formulary, so I didn't even have to go to the doctors anymore. And because the dermatologist treated me really badly and wrote an email about me and sent it around the whole hospital and everywhere, he sent it to everybody. Um, the medical director got in contact with me and said, whatever support I want, they will offer the support. So he told me what to do. I spoke to the GPs, the commissioners, and he spoke to the pediatricians and doctors in the hospital. And he found me a pediatric um, dermatologist to work with. So the eczema clinic I set up, it's still running today. I set it up in 2006. And when I left, I'd already trained up a nurse to run it. So everything you do, make sure there's some sustainability and somebody else that could continue the work when, once you've gone on. And that nurse, I, when I wrote, a, I wrote a chapter in a book, I got in contact with her so we could write the chapter in the book together. So she's still in the clinic now, running the clinic. So my greatest achievement. I love that. And Mary C. Cole, um, just to say, I, was, did, I started my training in 1982. And I qualified in 85, and it wasn't until 2004 that I found out about Mary Seacole, who was a black nurse, half Jamaican, half Scottish, um, that came to the England, went to the Crimea War, was actually went to afternoon tea with Vic Queen Victoria, and nobody knew about her. She was hidden away for over 2,000 years. And I said, if she can be excavated from obscurity and placed in a position of prominence, then there's hope for black nurses to progress and do well. So I was the fundraiser, one of the fundraisers for the Mary Seacoe Statue of Hill. I used to sell those badges for a pound or two. I was selling for two pounds. And the statue is now up. And the Mary Seacoe, I think, when I showed the picture of this picture of her to my mum, my mum said it looks like her great-great-grandmother. So I said there's a possibility that Mary Seacoe could be related to me. But still. Yeah, so um, I got an outstanding service award from the Queen's Nurses Institute in 2012, which was absolutely amazing. I never even heard of them properly before. I got that award and since then I've become a Queen's nurse. And um, Alan Titchmarsh, I'm sure you might have heard of Alan Titchmarsh from Love Your Garden, got in contact with me and they came and they did my garden. And in the bottom of my garden, he said, why should we do your garden? I said, I told him, I don't like gardening. I don't like digging up weeds. I don't like watering plants. I ain't got time for any of that. I just like to look at the beauty of it all. So just give me a low maintenance stuff and put a prayer house at the bottom of the garden. I'll get up in the morning and go to the bottom of the garden and pray and prepare for work. And he said, a garden for prayer and meditation. So he's done an absolutely beautiful garden. It still looks great. And I said, my favourite colour is purple. I just want purple flowers in the garden. The garden has got palm trees in it. It looks absolutely phenomenal, even up to now. So that's just amazing. Um, 2015, I got an honorary doctorate from Middlesex University. I did teaching at Thames Valley University, Hertfordshire University, um, Middlesex University and LSBU, London South Bank University. And Middlesex was the only one that never paid me. And one day when I asked for payment, they paid me and, then they, and they videoed me and paid me and then they never asked me back again. But all those years later, they got in contact with me and gave me an honorary doctorate. So I forgive them. And that's just to say my publications, please make sure you write what you do. Some of you are doing absolutely fantastic stuff, but you just don't know how brilliant you are because nobody tells you. Make sure I make a point of writing an article every single year. And now I don't even have to write articles because people just get in contact with me and interview me and put it out there. So it's absolutely fine. <laughs> but I, wrote, I did write an article earlier on this year. And my best article is the challenges of identifying eczema in darkly pigmented skin in the um, Journal of Children and Young People, 2015. It took me 10 years to write that because they wouldn't ag agree with me when I, I wrote it in 2005. They said there wasn't enough evidence for it. Then they told me I didn't have enough information. Then they... But as soon as I went to LSBU as a senior lecturer, I did a Cochrane Library review, I did a research on everything, and I wrote that article. So do get a copy of the paediatric nurse, get a copy of that. That's my favourite article. Nearly finished. So, and that's just some of the awards that I've got. But my best one is the Zenith Global Health Award for, um, I do mission trips to Uganda, Ghana, and Kenya on an annual basis. And I just love it, love it, love it. Nearly finished, nearly finished, sorry. Um, um, you all should apply to become, to get a Mary Seacole Scholarship Award or Florence Nightingale Foundation Scholarships. These are scholarships that would, where money is attached to it, where you could get trained, developed, supported. Queen's Nurses Award as well. If you work in the community, apply for these things, you can get them and it will help you to progress and it will put your name on the map as well. This slide is especially for you. Have enthusiasm, passion and fervency in anything that you do. Excel in your area of experience and expertise. Have a personal development plan and also the five Ps, proper preparation prevents poor performance. 
See every obstacle, obstruction and opposition in your life as opportunities and ask yourself, what opportunity do I have to optimistically overcome my obstacles? See the windows of opportunity and go through the open doors. Be self-aware, self-managed, self-disciplined, have emotional intelligence. Utilize what you've got where you are until you get where you need to go. Often we're always thinking about the grass that's greener on the other side when actually right where you are, the resources and the people and the things that you need are around you to support you to get to your next level. Have a role model, a, a coach, a mentor that will support you and help you all along the way and exposure, let your light shine, let everybody know what you're doing. Go to meetings, speak up at meetings, attend conferences, um, write, do poster presentations, speak at conferences, put your name forward, write articles, let people know who you are and what you're doing. And just, just, my, just to show you my OBE from the Queen. When I got the OBE, I didn't even realise, I, I, I just could not believe, I didn't know. The Queen, knew, I think the Queen found out about me when I got the um, Outstanding Award from the Queen's Nurses Institute, because they told me that the Queen read the citation. But I got a letter from David Cameron saying he wanted to present my name to the Queen to get an OBE. I couldn't believe it. And when I got it, see me holding Prince William's hands there, I wouldn't even let go of his hands. It was really overwhelming. And then everybody kept telling me how wonderful I am. I know I'm wonderful, but it was just a bit over the top. So I left the country and I went to Kenya for four weeks and I stayed in the slum area with all those wonderful children. And they kept going, Auntie Joan, what does OBE mean? And I said, OBE means overflowing blessings every day. So every one of us have got overflowing blessings every day. And last but not least, my best legacy is I went to Kenya in 2002 for the very first time. And I met this little girl, God told me by blessing her, all the children in the village would be blessed. She even looks like my daughter. She calls me, I haven't got any children. She calls me uh, mum, and she, to me, she's my daughter. When she was 18, she told me that I was her greatest role model and she wanted to be like me. And she's now finishing her nurse training. She's doing nursing in midwifery and she's doing really, really well. She'll be, she should have qualified this year, but because of COVID, it got pushed back to next year. Um, but she's doing really, really well. And that's my last slide. If I can do it, you can do it too. Don't let anybody stop you. Don't let anybody hinder you. Be persistent, insistent and consistent. When there's resistance, you will get assistance and you will get there. Thank you. Please follow me on Twitter. And that's my email if you want to get in contact. Thank you very much. Sorry if I've gone over time. I was trying to watch it through. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, uh... Uh, Dr. Maris, I think talking about inspiration, um, uh, you actually are uh, showing the ins inspiration. So it's not only about talking uh, talking about it. So well done um, uh, and, and great uh, presentation to you and the um, co-panelist. Um, uh, uh, I am going to invite my uh, co-moderator, the very able Dr. Burnley, to um, come and assist with this part of it, uh, which would be question and answer. Now, um, people should feel free to indicate if they've got a question. I see Dr. Asar's hand up. I don't know if it is an indication that he wants to ask a question or he's still excited about the presentation that he's heard. But um, whatever the case is, everyone will have opportunity to answer the question i think you all agree with me that they the presenters have all been fantastic and and the more uh, insight they give the more possible questions um uh, we will we can find so i encourage people to take the opportunity like dr Meyer said don't be shy ask questions join in contribute and so on so this is an opportunity for each and every one of us to ask questions um uh, to the three powerful presenters. You so can either indicate by putting your hand up or you can put your question on the chat. Um, uh, uh, we will be looking at both. Should I be checking the chat? Please do. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, they're all so impressed by Dr. Myers. Um, <laughs> I think we've stunned them into silence. Good God, Dr. Myers, I think, oh, I think we now have, you know, I mean, Cameroon Nurses Association, they've just had a mentor <laughs> who will be looking after them, you know, subsequently. So Dr. Myers, you're here to stay with us. <laughs> okay. I'm the, I, that's, what, that's what I do. I like to encourage, empower, enable, 
anybody and everybody that wants to progress because I know how challenging and difficult it is. But if I can do it, you all can do it too. Uh, this is the spirit. If you can do it, anybody else can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is the 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 the, um, the the message that I would want the Cameroon nurses to take on board with them. You know, there are challenges, of course. I mean, all the speakers, you know, you could see that they've had challenges, but at the same time, they've equally had achievements. You know, but what is important in life, especially when you're working in this country, you know is to learn from that experience and become more resilient. Okay. Yes, um, uh, President, um, the President of CNA, um, Cameroon Nurses Association, um, uh, Rose Ombu, uh, your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Modrito. Yes, I've got three lovely questions for the three speakers. Um, I will have to start by saying thanks to all three of you. It's been very moving. Um, John, you know, as you walk into the room, I can't stop laughing. You know, you just bright me, so, so thank you. But I think my first question, which is for Eli, so this, this first speaker, you talk about some lows and you talk about some highs in terms of your experience that you've had. I just want to understand how do you feel the most significant low? How did you overcome that? Sorry, um, uh, Rose, can you, I think you might have got two um, um, appliances uh, at this on at the same time. And, Sorry, and, and it's that echoing. is why it may be echoing. Yeah. So if you turn off one, then it will come out clearer. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Much better, yes. yes. Okay. So Eli, my first question is to you. Um, and it's about this, one of the law that you mentioned. Again, that was around pro career progression or training, how did you overcome that? Well, <laughs> um, yes, um, they were very interesting. I just had to keep pushing, keep requesting for, for the opportunity to, to apply for the, for the next training whenever you know, uh, possible. Then keep uh, looking for opportunity of um, position everywhere else, studying, studying, studying other opportunities that were available, you know, elsewhere, in, uh, as time was going on, and mapping my, 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 my plan to, to exit the environment where I was working. And it did work after, after, after three disappointments of, um, you know, um, disqualification to to e grade i got uh, i got an offer for job in an outpatient clinic which was fantastic nine to five after a night shift i went for interview the next day at 10 o'clock and i got the job okay that's fantastic that is that's, that's very um that's very good uh, Ross, you, you said you had three questions. Could you just ask the two remaining questions? Yeah. Um, uh, together. Yes, ask them together quickly so that we could take other people. Okay. So the second one is for Isabel. Being the sort of younger generation, what, has, what kind of advice would you give some of us, the older generation of nurses, black nurses, in terms of the challenges that you've seen and what can we do? Because most of us are not born in this country. So we possibly don't understand what you understand differently in the nursing work. What can you tell us in terms of helping us how we move forward with our career? So that's the second one. And the third one is for um, Dr. Mayers. Again, in terms of resilience, I know most of us are from, you know, ethnic minority and we, it comes naturally. 
the resilience in the nursing world. How do we build that? So how do we stay focused regard, despite all the disappointment that people in terms of career progress, they can't get. So you go for one job to the other, you get failures and you continuously get failures. How do we keep that resilient going? Thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the, um, uh, Isabel, is you are to do the second question. Uh, what kind of advice could you give to the not so young um, uh, nurses? Um, um, to be honest, um, I think one thing is is um, that I noticed when I qualified is a lot of older nurses, um, you know, would kind of keep to themselves. Um, so, you know, when they saw maybe younger nurses, they didn't really necessarily like um, warm to them. They didn't, they didn't always come and say like let me help you let me show you it was kind of like you know you you'll figure it out yourself and I mean you know just moving forward I think now it's like you, the narrative basically just needs to change where it's like you know if you do see a young person who's just coming to the job it's like it's okay to help them like they probably do want help and support um you know because that's the reason why a lot of young people tend to leave the job because they don't see anyone that they can aspire to be because as we call them, the older aunties tend to just keep to themselves and, you know, and you just feel like you don't have anyone who is also black who, you know, you can lean towards. So just be more open to helping the younger black generation, I guess. Okay. Thank you so much. That's um, uh, quite um, uh, clear and precise. We may come back to that um, uh, later. And then the third question is to um, uh, Dr. Myers OBE, resilience uh, in the nursing world. How do we build it? That's a really good question because if there's any, any time we need resilience, it is now. But I think it's built in from inside. We need to have self-belief. We need to really be able to manage our own emotions and be focused and know what we want and let nobody deter us. And then as Isabella said, we need to have people around that will support us along the way as well. So I have lots of men, even now, I still have a lot of mentors and coaches. I have lots of coaches, people that I would go to. And as um, Isabella said, sometimes people are all just in their own little silo looking after themselves, but we need to step out and see what can I do to support and help other people. And that's what I like to do. I, I always think that I'm in a position for a reason, for a purpose to support and help other people. So if I see there's one person in the corner, I will make a point of going to that person to encourage them and to let them know that they're not on their own. So that's what we need to do. We need to support and help each other and lift other people up as we go up as well. Good, fantastic. And, and if I could just say, cause I say this everywhere I go and I haven't said it and I might not get the opportunity again. This is a message to every one of you. You are all one of a kind right from God's mind, you are a divine design and there's no one else like you on the face of this earth. You're not just one in a million, you're one in 7.8 billion. And if you were not here, the world would not be the same without you. You are here for a reason, just for a season, not for life. But while you have life, make sure you leave a legacy for life. And the only way to do that is to have a vision, a passion and a dream and fulfill it. Amen. Good. Thank you so much. Well done. Uh, well said, uh, Dr. Myers. Um, OBE. Any other questions? Any questions or comments? Any comments, suggestions? I have a comment and uh, I'm happy to, to acknowledge um, Isabel, uh, no support uh, regarding supporting the the young ones. I feel so gratified when I meet a nursing student from the Black Mano community group coming to, to my help for me to mentor them during their placement. I feel so fulfilled having to show them the way around to, to make up and to encourage them to, to study well, 
to study hard and to, to be very questioning, to absorb as much information as possible, to look for opportunity to gain you know, skill and knowledge throughout the training placement because that is the only moment they will be able to ex be exposed to see as much as possible to lead them to you know fulfilling a nursing career in the future okay thank you thank you so much um uh, mrs term for Ma, Ma Rose Atta, I saw, I saw your hand up. Uh, it's still yes, up, yes. It's still up. It's still up. Well, uh, Dr. Joan, I am just like you, okay? Um, I finished my nursing in 1979 in Cameroon. I went to a Catholic nursing school, worked in a, a government hospital for a couple of years, got married, went to Germany, where I also worked in a pediatric unit. Then uh, when things did not work well, I came to England. I wanted to do midwifery but they would not recognize my certificate in Cameroon as a nurse. So I thought, okay, doing the conversion course to get a place was quite difficult. So I decided, okay, I'm going to do the nursing all over. So my friends would say, oh, it's too long, it's too long. Ah, I said, well, I must do it, you know, I don't have a choice. So I decided to do the nursing. And by then you have to apply for work permits. So when I was doing my nursing, I would write the home office, sit on my table, I write the home office, I said, look, I'm a student nurse. I need to do some practicals outside my nursery so that I can get experience. And they gave it to me. I never consulted a lawyer since I came to this country. They gave it to me. So I was doing agency, working in nursing homes. You know, immediately I was going to finish my nursing. I already got a place to do my midwifery because my target was midwifery. So I said, I cannot leave Cameroon as a nurse and go back as a nurse without a certificate. I said, no. Even though I did tropical nursing, the nursing is a bit different. The fact that I did nursing gave me a lot of experience you know, better than people who are going in for their first time. So I finished my midwifery. Six months before I was to, you know, my visa was to run out because they give you the visa. When it's going, you are finishing, your visa is running out. I already started looking for a job and I got a job to work in Newham as a midwife. So I worked in midwife, uh, as a midwife for 10 years, but I was used to apply to get a G grade. I had it every day. They will not give it to me. So I decided to do a course. You know, when they, you discharge a woman, you talk about uh, uh, contraception and then you refer them to the, to the GP. So I said, okay, but I can do that, can't I? And then I told my manager, I said, we're always giving advice. It's better for me to do this course so that I will know what advice I can be giving them, not just referring them to the GP. That is how I went to do a city university. I did my uh, uh, family planning and to do family planning, you must do smear tests. So I did both. And when they were not giving me, so when I was working, I said, but how am I going to get another job? You know, I don't want to leave me to, I don't want this shift running up and down. My mother is sick. I have to leave home early and go back like she's sleeping. Then one woman said, but why don't you be a practice nurse? So I decided not to be a practice nurse. And the fact that I did family planning and the smear, and then uh, 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 HIV, I also did the HIV course at City University. I was placed in a better position and I got the job immediately. I was only in the community for a year and I got my G grade. So I will advise you, we black people have to work hard because when I was a midwife, if they said, um, uh, work on labor, what I'll run and go. Go to this world, the community, I was going everywhere, teaching parent crap. But some people say, oh no, I've not worked in labor world for a long time. No, that is the only way we get experience. You have to push yourself. And you have to be studying. Even now that I'm retired, because of the uh, COVID, I, I've not worked for more than a year. I'm still doing webinars because I have a passion for diabetes. I can talk about diabetes from morning to evening. I still have a passion. I'm still listening to webinars. I'm not just sitting and hold dormant. I just did the yeah. two, it's two day course. So I'm really happy. I like the way you spoke. I am very, very impressed. That will give motiva motivation to the young people not to surrender because they are black. I've never looked at myself as black, but as a human being. All right. Thank you so much, Maris. I think um, uh, you're also quite inspirational in so many regards. Uh, and talking about HIV, I remember the early days when we came to this country and we're attending um, uh, evenings, uh, functions and so on. You always reminded us to be careful 
and say HIV is real. And if you want, you come to Newham Hospital, I'll take you people to the ward and you can see for yourself. So be very careful. And, and for that, we remain very grateful to you, uh, Marius. Thank you so much. Mm. Moving on, um, um, I think I saw the hand of Mabia. Mabia, was your hand up? Okay. If the hand is no longer up, I um, um Antoinette Obi. Okay. Hi, I haven't got much of a voice. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. All right, me. okay, that is what I that's a, <laughs> my beyond, okay, yes. It's so, Mabi, it's Mabi. Mabi, Mabi. 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 Oh, my apologies, Mabi. <laughs> completely useless. But that's what I saw <laughs> so, on the screen. Oh, hi, Julius. Nice to, see, nice to see everyone's face. And it's really nice to see that you nurses are doing fantastic work in the UK, contributing to the community. And I have to be, I'm a proud mommy, you know, that I'm here listening to what you, your, you guys' journey. And my daughter is part of that journey. All I want to say is continue to do your good work and continue to shine so that a young black woman can follow in your footsteps. I'm a teacher. I teach health and social care. I would like one of you one day to actually come to my classroom and speak to the nurses or the students who would like to become nurses or going to nursing and to realize that there is light at the end of the tunnel and there are women who have gone before them and they just need to follow in and open the doors for them literally so that they can shine through. So thank you very much for the wonderful work you guys are doing. God bless. Thank you. That's my contribution. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Thank you very Sorry. much. Sorry. Just to say that I'm very happy to come to your school if it's in London. It is <laughs> in London. Been... I'll definitely get in touch with you. I keep yeah. you not. <laughs> I just spoke to year six students in the school in Croydon the other day and they wrote to me to tell me that quite a few of the children want to become doctors and nurses now as a result of uh, me sharing my experience. So mm -hmm. that would encourage people to come and work in the NHS and to let them know that black start, black nurses, black people can go up the ladder and can progress. I'd be happy to do Exactly, that. exactly. I and to know the different the... routes and channels they can take and the patients mm -hmm. and they need the, they themselves need the patients to go through um, to, to go on that journey if they want to get there because I think uh, you know from my observation when you look at a lot of young people nowadays nurses included um, young nurses not that I'm talking about my daughter sorry Isabel but you know they want to go they want to get there very quickly but they don't want to put in the time and the patience you know so it's nice for you guys it'll be nice for you guys to you know actually visit the schools and, and speak to the students so that they know that they do have to put in the work and if they put in the work they will, they will get um there will be something at the end there's a, always going to be a positive outcome despite the challenges <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat if you want to okay. get in contact with me thank you thank you thank you so much um uh, ma obi thank you <laughs> okay all right and, good was there any other I'll hand that I have not called? I think we saw Dr. Asa's physical hand. Yes, I, 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 I thought I saw that as well, but he declined that. But <laughs> again, being a chief, uh, when the chief is called to say what, uh, the chief would really um, not say no because he's there for the people. And Thank I'm sure with much. his with his, with his bad <laughs> loads of experience in the <laughs> medical world, he, he will have something to say, even if he's a minute. So uh his royal highness, uh oh the floor is yours. Oh dear. Um thank you for that um, uh, wonderful introduction. And I must say I find this uh, virtual this first webinar fascinating. I just wanted to ask two things. Um and actually I should also uh, uh commend uh uh Joanne who I know from my work in the, at the Sickle Cell Society, John, John might not know because I'm wearing a hat, so he probably doesn't recognize me anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but those days at the Station Road and the, all the AGMs and things around the NHS, fantastic support that you, 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 you and your team have done for the Sickle Cell work in the NHS. And of course, this CNA initiative is wonderful. I just have two quick things. Um, the first one is, uh, looking at the screen, I see only uh, Romain, 
as a as a, as a as a male nurse, uh, it would be interesting to know what do we do to get um, um the other gender well, kind of forgotten gender into into nursing. Uh, it might be interesting to see what the man, what the woman might want to say, or maybe the CNA themselves, or and of course Joanne. The second point is essentially more for the purpose of the organization itself, the CNA, for this fantastic work. I don't know if that was done in the introduction before I came on board. In terms of what are some of the, 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 the challenges with regards to developing people that um, the CNA is already facing? Uh, because those are the, some of the things that with all Joanne's and my connections, uh, Joanne may be very useful as a resource person to uh, to effectively build up the capacity of CNA to address some of those uh, people issues. I know you, you, from uh, John's presentation, the personal motivation approach was wonderful, um, but also in terms of building the capacity of CNA, in terms of being able to do that for many more uh, uh, other, other nurses out there who, who are probably not members of the CNA to bring them on board and those who are on board to also keep them there. So I've just asked two things, one, um, what do we do about the, the, the male gender? Because I don't seem to see them on the screen. Only Romana can recognize. And then secondly, um, how, how, what are some of the things that um, uh, CNA might, might benefit from uh, uh, the, the resourceful uh, opportunity people like uh, Joanne can provide to make sure that um, uh, this wonderful work continues at the individual level and for the foreseeable five, 10, why not 20, 30 years? Those are just two quick points I wanted to make. Fantastic uh, show this is going. Okay, thank you so much, His Royal Highness. I am very happy that we insisted that you say a few words because your two points that you've made are very pregnant and very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'll invite uh, Romain um, uh, to, 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 to respond to that, especially the first point um, about male nurses. Uh, Romain, tell me, are you kicking all the men away uh, yeah. to be with all the women or what is happening? <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Moderator. Speaker, moderator. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yeah. we can hear you loud and clear. Can see yeah, you. As you can see, uh, Arumet is a very handsome man. And when people come here, they panic. They just, you know. <laughs> 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 right. Uh, for some reason, I don't know, the experience that we have with Cameroon male nurses who have, during, uh, we have joined this association since I have become a member is that they are the most disappointing one. So when they come, they might have other agenda that I don't know. I was a, uh, when I was elected president of this association, I had a, a, co uh, a vice president who happened to be a, 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 a male nurse. He came with a lot of um, enthusiasm and showed that he was supported from Cameroon by the association. But just disappeared like that. For no, no reason, you know, he didn't come back again. Just disappeared. I don't know what was his problem. We text him, we did everything. He didn't come back. After that one, there's another one that is, uh, is, is been in the association now for almost uh, three to four years, just uh, sneaking in like that, no paying his, his membership, not doing anything at all, and then probably waiting for occasion to attend. And that is not, um, you know, that hasn't been good for us. It's, it make, it put us in a very, very difficult situation. Should we allow him to stay? Should we, you know, has been very, very difficult to, to deal with such thing. Now, what I think is that, as you, are, you were all saying, there is a big challenge. For me personally, to be sitting every time in, in, in between women, and then you know, men come in are not, not staying. Is it because nurse is a female work? Or I don't know. That sometimes I ask myself this, 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 this question. Am I in the right profession? But because I have, I have that determination to, to do what I want to do, to support my people back home especially, that doesn't drag me down. I still come, I still want to do what I want to do. And then, uh, yeah, try to encourage them to come. I brought my friends, my personal friends here, but they were the, they were the first ones to disappoint me. These are my friends that we share food at home, go to Njangi, everything that you know, but they came to the association and they were the first 
disappoint me. So I don't know if they, what are the main problem. Maybe they think, oh, nurse, we, do, we, want, we, we don't want to show ourselves as nurses because it, it looks more female. I, 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 I just don't, I'm not able to work that one out. But as we are here today talking about challenges, it's another challenge. And I promise that Mr. Joanda will be contacting her. So yeah, uh, it's a good place to learn. I, will, I want to pass a message outside there for all male nurses to join us. CNA has got a different um, a format now. We're working hard. Let us come and bring and tell us what our problem, how can we how we can be supported and I can see that from today we've got a lot of support there we've got mentors we've got role models that have uh, shown up there I'm not saying that we didn't have them before but we were most focusing on how to get the association to stand up thank you very much for bringing that um uh, uh question back to you okay thank you very much uh, I, I think you've made some very um, uh, good points maybe the way forward is that you, uh, there's a sub branch. You, you try to get the, the male nurses together and have some meeting, and then maybe get you know get them to understand they need to work in together and so on. Uh, it may be something that you, you consider, and I, I, I'm sure um, um, other people around the table and those um, attending this webinar will be more than happy to uh, attend as well and um, give the support that it needs to bring them back on board because it is just so important that we, uh, in terms of gender, we are balanced uh, at all times. Okay, good. The, the second point was about um, um, uh, the challenges in terms of um, supporting people. I see um, uh, Bridget's hand is up. Um, um, did you have a new question or did you want to have a go at the second point raised by Dr. Asa? A different question. It's a, it's a okay, different, it's a different it's question good. altogether. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll come to you after immediately after this. Could someone um, uh, deal with this point about the challenges in terms of supporting people? I know Dr. Myers spoke quite lengthy about this uh, and covered this. But if anyone else has something to say about supporting people, then maybe uh, this is an opportunity. Okay, um, uh, Madam President, I see your hand up. Just to, I, I, I don't know, that it's, I, I'm not sure Dr. Asa whether we could actually answer your question, but to add to what Romain is saying, it is true, nursing is not a, you know, men don't easily go into nursing. So there are very few male nurses for a start. Um, and there has always been. The numbers has increased recently, but it remains a woman's well. Secondly, Cameroonians there who are nurses, who are male nurses are far, are very few. So that might be one of the issues. But the few that are around, um, I'm sure, what Romain said or what, you know, we don't really understand. In terms of the challenges and support, and again, I think this first webinar, and, you know, I'm really grateful that Dr. Mayer is here, um, but that was the opportunity because I think to most of us in this group, it is an opportunity for us to see how whatever challenges that we face in particularly around our development as nurses, that there are mentors out there that can actually support us. So this is an eye opener. This is an, this is an awareness for us as a group and to work as a collective to be able to seek that support and be committed to the support. So I think what I'll say is watch the space um, and I'm hoping, and I'm really, really grateful that all three speakers particularly, um, it was a, a real good, you know, I was really praying that Dr. Mayas would be here because I really wanted the group to hear that. Um, so thank you, Dr. Asa. I know you always have challenging questions. Thank you very much. Yes, can okay, just, good. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's can I just very... say something? I, I have to leave in a moment, but can I just say, um, there's a diaspora group of all the different, um, I hope that you're part of Rose and the, the, the Ugandan nurses, the Kenyan nurses, Caribbean Nurses Network. And I know they do have a chairs meeting with all of the diaspora groups. You can get support from them. And as I mentioned before, 
it's open for people to apply for the Florence Nightingale Foundation. They've got specific courses specifically for black and ethnic minority nurses as well. So do look out on their website for any um, courses that are available, which are free and also funding where they will give um, scholarship funding to develop your leadership capacity, as well as the um, Mary Seacole Scholarship Awards, which is now under the Florence Nightingale Foundation as well. There are lots of opportunities out there for you to progress and develop. Yeah. I have to leave because I've got another meeting. So, sorry, Dr. Oh, my, Mano, question, Dr. My, my question was for you. <laughs> yeah, can I just, um, uh, so have you got time to take the question? Otherwise, yeah. may I? I'll just... take the question. I'll take the question. Okay, Bridget, can you ask the question then, please? Dr. Myers, the, the problem we've got in my trust at the moment is uh, the, the second speaker said the mature nurses, particularly the BIM ones, they are not coming forward to help the young, the younger ones. Mm. And what we've got at the moment, we've employed lots and lots of young Nigerian and Ghanaian nurses that are quite young. And the feedback we also get from them is exactly what the second speaker said, that the older generation are not helping them out on the wards, being the BIM, majority the BIM ones. What advice have you got that we can actually give it to this, uh, these uh, senior nurses who can help the younger ones? I think we could talk to the um, the Nigerian Nurses Association, the president there, and see what she can do, because they're they're quite they're one of the longest um, associations, and they have quite a lot of the older nurses there. Maybe we need to speak to them about that and find out what the issue is. But often it's best to find a mentor that wants to mentor you. Maybe we appear challenging. I was told that I was very challenging as a student, and nobody wanted to be my mentor because I was always asking questions. But the mentor that I did have, I've still got her up to, to now. Now She was my mentor when I did my paediatric course in 1984, 1985, and we're still in contact now. So it's finding somebody that, that's willing to support you. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a black person. It does help if it's a black person when they understand all the different issues going on. But there's lots of people out there that can support you. Just find the ones that want to support you. Okay. Um that is uh, very, very good. Thank you so much. I, I know you're pressed for time. Uh, you've been wonderful. I mean, I'm sure you, you've um, uh, seen the reaction. And, and personally, you know, you, you, I think you've really made us all aware that we can go to higher heights um, uh, and, and, and we just have to concentrate and work and believe in ourselves. But most importantly, you have God in the equation. Mm -hmm which is, you know, which is outstanding, just mind blowing. And so we, we, we can do it without the help of God. And, um, uh, and, and, and finally, your point about looking for mentors, not only from the BME background, um, on the 28th of um, October last month, uh, I was invited as uh, one of the guest speakers at the, um, um, the uh, Black Champions in the Law um, and, and uh, my, I was talking about my mentor was a white man. This 28th of October, uh, I, I spoke about him um, and uh, two days after he died. And, oh. and I just feel so sad about it. But just to say that it doesn't have to be a white person. Anybody in your setting, in a hospital, as a nurse and so on, who is friendly and has the experience and willing to help could do as much um, a good job than a black sister or brother um, uh, in the circumstance. But when you acquire the experience, you try to share it. So Dr. Uh, Miles MB OBE, sorry, we are grateful that you made it uh, here today with us. And we look forward to engaging you with all the plethora of problems or issues that we have raised here today and, and more. Mm -hmm. If we can put our hands together in the traditional way to acknowledge her. Thank you so much and good luck with your next meeting. Okay, thank you very much and thank you to all of you and all the best as well. Happy thank to you. support whenever I can in the future. All the best. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. Good. Any more questions or comments? Otherwise, we will um, uh, be inviting Dr. Burnley to um, uh, uh, round up our uh, our session before the um, uh, other closing remarks and so on um, as moderators. Yeah, before the vote of thanks from Amina. Yes. Yeah, I must say I've really enjoyed this webinar. You know, it's the first 
but it has been so productive. Productive in the sense that it has really equipped us with a lot of information as to what goes on in nursing. Nursing is a very rewarding you know, uh, profession. But at the same time, as we have seen today, it is full of challenges. And I think what has been so beneficial, you know, from this webinar today is the fact that we can take home three, maybe two or three key things, you know, from the webinar. The importance of staying resilient in the face of these challenges. The importance of sustaining that resilience. And I think this is where, you know, the coaching and the mentoring aspects actually come in, will really come in very, very, very handy. And I think this is something that um, the Cameroon Nurses Association should take on board in terms of that continuous professional development and also having good mentors. You know, um, Dr. Myers is a very good example. You know, she's there. So please, CNA, use her. I don't, I don't think she would want me, she would want me to be using this, this phrase, use her. But she has lots of experience, skills, expertise, that if you, know, you take on board, you can really benefit a great deal and you can have that value added. And hopefully you can face those challenges very confidently. You know, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, we, we are all from black and ethnic backgrounds. You'll be surprised to hear that I've, I'm equally what, whatever was being said today resonates with me. And I'm quite sure it's the same with everybody else, regardless of whether you're a nurse or a midwife, you know, it resonates with all of us, you know, but the question always is, what do we do? How do we cope with these challenges? And I think we have actually, you know, benefited today from these webinars in terms of you know, um, some um, indications as to what we could do, what we could start thinking about in terms of doing, you know, to cope with these challenges. Okay, so I hope this is not the first and the very, very successful. So this is a good platform, you know, to continue along these lines. So hooray, the nurses. Thank you. Hip, hooray. Hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. 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 Well done. Well done. Yeah. So um, we would now like to pass on the button to Amina <laughs> for a vote of thanks, Amina. A short one, of course. Um, I would just like, to, I'm just going to do the vote of thanks to everybody. And I'll just say, dear members of the Cameroon Nurses Association, Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to say a vote of thanks for our first webinar, which has taken place today, the 13th of November, 2021. To all our delegates uh, who have um, joined us today from the, across the globe, I'm sure we have people all over the country, and our moderators, Dr. Barrister Kafu and Dr. Ms. Rose Burnley. We can always count on you too. If we don't see you, we know where to find you. <laughs> so, and also to our great guest speakers, Ms. Elizabeth Tamufo, um, Isabel Akinola, and Dr. John Myers, uh, who has opportunity. Um, we we'll just busy schedule, especially at this um, pandemic um, time. On behalf of the Cameroon Nurses Association, we all say welcome. Without your presence, uh, the webinar would not have been able to take place and be successful today. As you know, you can plan something. If you don't have your guest speakers, you don't have your um, <clears throat> guests to attend, then it's useless. It's like cooking food and you don't have somebody to eat it. So you stop with it in your throat, eat it all. <laughs> you have all contributed in one way or the other. Our guest speaker is Elizabeth Tamufo, um, Isabella Kinola and Dr. Myers. What a great opportunity. Also, Dr. Myers, when you listen to her speech, you always want to bring her back. Oh, she has disappeared. I was just going to say we're going to adopt her in our Cameroon Nurses Association, if that's okay with all of you. 
yep. we'll, be, we'll be chasing her up if it's okay with you. Sure, we can do that. I'll keep up with her and as well as Miss Rose Humble. Thank you for inviting her. And I'll just say, well, let's give a hand of applause to all our three guest speakers. Well done. And we hope you had a great opportunity today and we look forward to you joining us in our next webinar, which will be planned soon, probably next year. And uh, thank you all for attending. Can I also, can I just interject, Amina? Uh, can I also invite um, the audience, you know, to give um, a round of applause to our able and capable barista Mkafu. He's done a fantastic job in coordinating, you know. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Burnley. I know you always come up with something like that. But I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. But you all, you, you know that you open it in a such grand style that I just had to try to keep up with your, you know, your, 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 your grandeurs. So a round of applause to Dr. Benley as well. And and just one small point. I mean, uh, you, you, you said so well, but you referred to me as Dr. Barista. I'm not a doctor. Oh, I'm just so a barista. Well, you might get to that. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't um, uh, you know, when you see the doctors, you know, um, uh, I, I, I couldn't, you know, be that solid as some of them you could see from their face to go up and up and up to become a doctor. So I just stayed as a, a, a barrister at my level. So <laughs> thank you so much. It's nice to have such an honest barrister. You know, <laughs> lawyers, lawyers are not known for their honesty, yeah? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, everyone. Yeah, it looks like Marosi, Marosi, you're trying to say something. Um, yeah. uh, yes, I am. It's just a bit of advice. Um, what I've noticed um, in this country and even in Germany where I was working is the black people feel inferior. When anything happens, they can't talk, they can't express themselves. They say, oh, they're treating me badly because I'm a black. Oh, but if you show that you know exactly what you're doing, you are studying, they cannot, when they ask you a question, you speak intellectually, they will not look down on you. So that is the encouragement I want to give our people. They should never, never accept that they're secondhand uh, class citizens. I refuse, I refuse, since I came to this country in 1981, refuse. Because if a white man attacks me, I speak to the white man like a human being, not as a black and white, like a human being, because the difference is the color. So I'm encouraging the young ones, don't go and, oh, this, oh, that. no, 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 no. Don't. And don't be rude. Dress properly. Don't dress shabbily. You know, be presentable with respectable dressing, and they will respect you. That's all I wanted to say. Very, very good point, Mama Rose. And uh, just adding up to that, um, uh, we are seeing, especially after this time of COVID, uh, I had the opportunity to get um, some information in relation to um, uh, the, the discipline and the amount of cases being taken up um, uh, against nurses uh, by the uh, and, um, and Nursing and Midwifery Council. And I always, as I've always said here, please, please, make sure you just stand on the right side because uh, irrespective of the fact that they're saying the shortage of nurses um, uh, um, across the country as a whole, that there's never a shortage of the idea of prosecuting nurses who fall foul of um, uh, their uh, uh, professional um, um, ethics. So always make sure you please you stand on the right side. And if you are unfortunate that you've you make an error and if you just seek advice as soon as possible, don't wait for them. Don't wait to be taken to the uh, NMC because it's usually not a very good experience. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Barista Kafun, perhaps you, we could arrange, you know, for you to come sometime in the near future to give a talk, you know, to the nurses about this issue. But yeah, I think we could do something together, all of us, from really different um, uh, perspective. But I, I worry about it because as recently as possible, they are, they are recruiting prosecutors, even more prosecutors for nurses. And mm -hmm. I know that our, our Black nurses are always, you know, if there are 10 people being prosecuted in, in, in the day, uh, I can, you know, 
um, there's never going to be a shortage of BME nurses among the, the, the 10. Even if it's two or three out of 10, it's two, two or three too many um, uh, giving the... the, the Oops, being loud. Again, it, it stopped. The recording stopped and now it's started again. So we could really, you know, um, organize some workshops in the near future, you know, to have talks on various issues that we think are very, very, very important, you know, um, for the group. And again, as um, um, Barry Kafu said, you know, I mean, caring and sharing. Sharing, you know, your ideas, sharing best practices, sharing, you know, even with organizations outside the organization, you know, spreading your tentacles as much as possible, you know, that's a sure way of, of really ensuring that you're getting all the necessary information, mm -hmm. all the necessary skills that would equip you, you know, to cope with these challenges that we've been talking about. Good. Well, uh, and I, I know I'm coming again, and I, I, I only come back so many times because of something I, I, I know is extremely important. And I say this because I have represented people and I've, kept, I've advised uh, uh, people, nurses, uh, uh, doctors who have had uh, problems with their uh, regulatory body. And I can tell you that it is quite stressful. And all the reason I'm saying this so over and over, I can just avoid that, avoid it getting to that point. The moment you have anything, you know, just call, get advice. You're getting advice for initial advice for free. You don't even need to, you know, and, and the training, if you know what to do at the training, like the day, um, uh, workshop day, you know, usually very good because we'll probably cover things along the lines of note record keeping or some small things that we tend to kind of just ignore them. But when things go pear shaped, they come back to bite us big time. And it's, it can be really stressful dealing with NMC or the, 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 the doctor's uh, regulatory, or any of these regulatory, it can be really stressful because every time you come back from work and you see a letter from them, before opening the letter, you are already, your whole day is gone. You, you know, before you even start reading that letter, what, what they've said, and it could be really long drawn. So if whatever we can do to avoid getting to that point, even, you know, would come in handy. I'll really stop talking now for real. <laughs> Right. So I think we've I think we've come to the end now, Madam President. Yes, Dr. Bonley, we have um, come to the end. Amina has done the vote of thanks. Yeah. Um, board moderators have done a great summary. I can only use this point to say I can't thank all of you enough. Again, there was a word that Amina you use, which just reflecting and thinking about when once I heard it. You can make food, then you can't have people to eat it, or you can't have the appetite, then the food will be waste. So all the work that we've done, we might not have had anybody here today. So whatever, in, you know, how tiny your contribution has been, just the fact that you've taken the afternoon to sit here today means a lot. So thank you all. And I really, really want to say um, we quite immature, they were trying. Um, I can't thank Romaine and Vicky enough because you can see we're doing our IT stuff. So the moderators will know. You can see we're trying to do our all our IT stuff in-house and they've been fantastic. So thank you for all your hard work and thank you, thank you, thank you. Hopefully this is the beginning of putting the chat. We're going to see a lot of Dr. Mayers, there's quite a few of them. Good. With such powerful. And I think if we can copy their footsteps and if we can get them to mentor us, then as Cameroonians, we've got a very successful journey ahead. So thank you all for your time. At this point, I'm going to ask the sort of core group to stay behind. Why? the others, so the core group of the people just to show some appreciation, particularly Eli, um, for what you've done, so well done, for us to do a bit of a reflection. So for the rest of you, if we don't see, 
So I visit us before Christmas. Have a wonderful Christmas. I'm surprised I'm saying have a wonderful Christmas in November, but there you go. Um, hopefully we shall see you some other time. Dr. Asa and the Cam Dog members who are here, thank you very much for joining us and hopefully see you soon. Um, Romain, we need to, we don't need to record the, Christiana, are you?